Good morning. Let's go ahead and uh, take out our Bibles. And uh, the first place that we're going to be turning to in God's Word is Matthew uh, chapter 10, verse 8. Uh, inside your service bulletin, you will find sermon notes for today that will help us uh, to be able to track along in God's Word uh, this morning as we continue our sermon series, The Heart of Christmas, and how Jesus is the center of of, of everything that is Christmas. Uh, Christmas is about Jesus. It's about Jesus coming into our world as that unique combination of God and man come together in this one person and, uh, and this, incredible, this incredible gift that God has uh, given to our world. And, and during this time of uh, the Christmas season, we, we want to unpack that more fully and, and look at it and explore it in even greater detail, especially as we take a look uh, today at our focus is why we give gifts. Where did that come from? Where did gift giving at Christmas time come from? And uh, although it has been, um, it has been kind of subverted by uh, Madison Avenue and people who see a way of uh, monetizing Christmas. That's not how it got started. That's not where it came from. And actually, the, the story of uh, Christmas gift giving really, really begins with God, doesn't it? It begins with God who gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not die but have eternal life. And we see that taking place, that, that first act in that great divine drama taking place with Jesus' birth. But where did it start in the Christian church? Where did Christ's followers pick up this, um, this tradition of gift giving at Christmas time. And there's actually a, an interesting backstory to that, and that during the initial uh, you know, first 300 years of the, of the, the Christian church's uh, genesis, uh, gift giving wasn't really a part of uh, the Christmas celebration, but it actually started uh, from a very interesting individual that, uh, that we're going to learn about this morning. And that is actually the first point on our outline, and that is Pastor Nicholas, and here's the fill-in, Pastor Nicholas and the practice of gift giving. Uh, so Pastor Nicholas uh, was a, a pastor in the area of Patera in uh, Asia Minor. And uh, he was a, a, a man who, who came from a very wealthy family, a very wealthy background. And instead of using all that financial wealth and largesse that, that his family had, uh, he didn't spend it on himself, but instead he decided to, to take those gifts that God had given him and his family and to make a difference in the lives of very, very poor people who lived in Patera, people who were members of his congregation and people who were, who were so, so destitute so destitute that they would sell their children into slavery and uh, would actually sell their, their daughters into prostitution. And so Pastor Nicholas's way of dealing with this was to secretly leave little bags of gold at the homes of families that he knew were striving uh, and whom he knew were um, wrestling with the issue, do I sell my child into slavery? Do I sell my, my daughter into prostitution? And in doing this was able to save these children and, and help to uh, maintain and keep intact the family unit. I mean, what a Christ-like thing that you begin to see that the money was simply a tool that uh, Pastor Nicholas had to make a godly difference in the lives of these people. And as these people saw what he was doing and, and why he was doing it, because not all of these people were members of his church. Some of these people were, were not Christians at all, but he gave uh, generously uh, to others around him and to, to, to be that blessing to uh, poor children and poor families. At least that's what the tradition about St. Nicholas tells us. You know him today as St. Nicholas, 
uh, also known as Santa Claus. And, and he's not that, that jolly, mythical uh, character uh, that we see you know, popularized in, in art and, uh, and that we see popularized right now, you know, the man in the red suit. Uh, but, but Pastor Nicholas was a very uh, serious and very sincere Christ follower who, who wanted to be a blessing. He wanted to be a blessing to the people that he served and to people who didn't know Jesus, just the way that God had been a servant to him, just as God had been a blessing to him. And so he wanted to be able to use and to leverage the gifts that, that God gave him to make a difference in these people's lives. Um, and so that, that tradition of gift giving has its roots in the Christian church through St. Nicholas's generosity and, and uh, the, the, the people of the church uh, adopted that, that gift-giving tradition for, for really you know, two reasons. First of all, uh, it was to remind believers of the greatest gift ever given, which is Jesus, which is the gift of the baby Jesus uh, who will grow up to be you know, that, that uh, great teacher, the Messiah, the deliverer, the one who will lay down his life at Good Friday, the one who will rise again from the dead uh, on Easter, and the one who has made that a huge impact in my life and your life and in countless billions of other people who have come to know Jesus Christ as that bridge to the Father, to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior, and, uh, and who celebrate the uh, the the um, the generosity of God. That was one of the the reasons. That's probably the greatest reason. But it was one of the other reasons why this became part of the the Christmas uh, gift giving tradition was so that we could um, touch the world around us who don't know Jesus, just like Saint Nicholas did in Patera. That we would touch the lives of people who don't know Jesus by our generosity. And that, that sampling of what it is like to, to be touched by Christ and the, that gift that God has given that leads to uh, that, that Jesus generosity that is inspired in us. And, you know, we see this, this, this theme of, of generosity, of over-the-top, extreme giving, extreme generosity, like we talked about in our last series, um, we, we see this, this, this level of generosity exemplified in Jesus. Here, here let's take a look at Matthew 10, 8. And in this passage, what we're seeing here is Jesus is now, he's trained his disciples. He's getting them ready. He's sending them out into, into groups of two. He sends them out into teams of two. And he's, he's letting them know, you know, you've been blessed with so many things from God. You've seen me do the things I'm doing. I'm now going to give you the power to do what I've been doing. And I want you to get out, out there and to make a difference. Here's what it says. Jesus is speaking to them. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. These words spoken to those, uh, those first disciples, those first Christ followers, those words are just as applicable to us today. Otherwise, it just become just words, just neat thoughts and, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, just platitudes that maybe we speak to one another. But they're more than that. These words continue to echo within the church. They need to. They need to be a part of who we are. They need to be a part of our core. They need to be the hallmark of what, what it looks like when a non-Christian looks at the church or he looks at you as a Christ follower. This is what, what they need to be seeing, is someone who is generous in this way and someone who gives as freely as they have been given to. And think about it. I mean, God has given us everything, everything, even down to that next breath that we're about to breathe, that next beat of the heart. It's, it's all a gift 
from God. Everything that we have, everything that you've accumulated or you've amassed in your life. Now, you might be tempted to say, I, I did this with all my own hard work. And you may have done a lot with your hard work to get where you're at. But if God had not given you the gift of a healthy body or a strong ability to get done the things that you've gotten done, or if it had been God's purpose that you could struggle and strive as much as you wanted, but this was not the path that he was going to have for you, then it would have come to nothing. And so the, the reality is that, yes, you know, we play a part in, in uh, the things that we do in our lives, how we take care of our families. Of course we do. Uh, but we also understand underlying all of that is God's generosity, God's willingness to give us the gifts, the talents, the abilities to be able to do these things. And to what end? Well, obviously he wants us to be able to, to, to take care of ourselves and our families, but there's a bigger picture there too, beloved. And at this time of the year, it's easy for us to talk about this because it's a no-brainer. It, it should be right on the top of our heads anyway, and that is to be a blessing to others, that we can do good things for other people by our, our gift giving. Um, you know, the, 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 the tradition of, of Christmas gift giving was, was never meant to put families in debt. I, you know, it's the interesting thing is St. Nicholas was trying to prevent that. He was trying to help families who were in dire straits to get out of that situation, to break free of it, and, and to be able to be, you know, independent and be able to uh, maintain their, that family connection. What a, what a huge, huge gift. And yet when we look at it, there are so many people that go into so much debt at Christmas time. And really for things they don't really need and for things that others that are close to them, I mean, it's, it's great to be generous, not knocking that. But if our generosity leads us to a place where we're putting the stability of our family, we're putting the uh, stability of our financial well-being at risk, because of, of, a, of a tradition that we're misunderstanding, um, we're actually working against what God wants us to do. Um, and I think this is a, a place where sometimes the church does need to speak out kind of strongly and say, don't do that. Don't go so far into debt that you're spending six months, nine months, you know, trying to dig your way back out of it just so that, you know, next year you get to the same place and you're having to do it again and again. It becomes a cycle, it becomes a pattern that we're not managing the, the, uh, the wealth that God brings into our lives efficiently and responsibly. And so it's the antithesis of why we give gifts at, at Christmas is not to go into debt, but is to be a blessing to other people and to be able to, to help one another. This kind of gift giving uh, that we've just been describing where we go into debt actually destroys the, the beauty of Christmas because it robs us of being able to enjoy the gift that God has given us because we are stressing out now. Now we've got to, in January, those bills are going to start coming and we're going to have to pay them off. And how are we going to do that? Where are we going to have to cut corners and, and what things will we have to sacrifice that you know maybe we really didn't need to? And um, one of the things that we, we, we want to remember when it, when it comes to these, to these, these gifts that, that God has blessed us with and, and that God has given us is, is that we want to remember that, that primary gift. And, and that's our next point on the outline. And that is the gift at the manger. The gift at the manger. Because when you look at Christmas, no Christmas gift ever is greater than the one that God gave through his son Jesus. No gift is greater than the little baby found nestled in that manger. What an unlikely place for such an extravagant gift to be found. I mean, you, you, this is not what you would expect, and this is exactly how God does things. He, he loves to use the unexpected. He loves to shock us, not because he wants to shock us just for shock value. He likes to shock us because sometimes we get so myopic in the way that we see things. We get so, um, so sold to a certain direction that we can't see, we can't hear, we can't even begin to consider other alternatives. And it's then that God breaks in to that by, by throwing something shocking in our path, like, a, like his son 
being born in a manger. This was always God's plan. God always knew this is the way it was going to happen. It wasn't an accident. This was, was planned from the very beginning. It was to arrest our attention and to show us that God isn't going to come into our world with, with trumpets blaring and blasting and big signs and lights and uh, you know uh, advertisements pointing to, to Jesus. Um, but instead, he comes into our world as this, as this little child born of two very humble parents and, and there's no room for them at any place in Bethlehem. The only place that's available for them is a barn. Uh, and, uh, and, and the only place for the baby's first bed is a, a feeding trough, is, is a manger. It's, it's just so like God to, to stand things on its head. What we would have expected of God, that's not what God did. And it gets us ready, you know, too, beloved. It gets us ready for the shockingly appalling thing that God is going to do, where, where this is all leading to, from the cradle to the cross, okay? So from the cradle to the cross, we see God doing one shocking, unexpected thing after the other through Jesus' life. And then the one that, that really arrests our attention is, is the one that begins on Good Friday where, where God gives his one and only son, where, where that, that gift that God gave to the world is nailed to a cross for our sins, for mine, and, and for the sins of the whole world. And, and as we've talked about so many times, but it's so important for us to, to come back to this, is that this was what God always intended would happen. It was never going to be about what we were going to do to make things right with God. It's always going to be what God was going to do to make things right between us. And this is how he does it. His son goes to the cross. That's the first part, you know, of that most appalling and shocking story. But the the second part of it, which is the beauty of it, the glory of it, is what takes place on Easter morning when we take a peek inside that empty tomb and we find that Jesus isn't there, that he has risen. He's risen just as he said he would be. And later in the day, Jesus is actually seen by his disciples and everything begins to change at that point. That is the greatest gift that has ever been given, that ever will be given. It is the single most important thing in human history is the life death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything else is just really kind of distractions. Everything in human history are, 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 tend to be outgrowths of the brokenness of humanity. But the central thing of human history is that God loves this world, sends his son right into the middle of it. And we, we are inheritors of that. We are the ones that receive the, that, that great gift. And we are the ones that God entrusts to, 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 to continue on that incredible work of Jesus, and in our lives and in ourselves to be that gift to the world until we can better introduce them to Jesus as they see it in us that maybe we can lead them to Jesus through what they're seeing in us. And that- okay, so let's take a look at Colossians 1, 19 through 20. Here's what Paul writes to us about, about um, this, this gift that God has given us through Jesus. Here's what he writes. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This is the gift that God has given to the world. This is that incredible the gift that is, starts out right here in the manger and that grows beyond that. And uh, it, it's, it's where Jesus just gives of himself, pours himself out. And these words here where it says that God reconciled everything to himself. In other words, God made things right. It's like we were talking about. We don't make it right. God makes it right. How does he do it? By reconciling everything to himself. He made peace with everything on heaven, in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. That's the gift that makes it all possible. And that leads us to our last point on the outline, and it's this. Uh, gift giving throughout the year. Gift giving throughout the year. Now, we're, uh, we're not going to talk about buying and giving gifts to one another. That, that's not really what we're talking about. Those are, those are nice things, but that's not what we're talking about. 
we're talking about being a gift ourselves. Do you see yourself? Do you see your life? Do you see your abilities as something that God wants to use, that God has given to you for a reason, and that God gives you so much of this that you're able to use and, and be a blessing in your own life, but he also wants us to, to use those gifts to be a blessing in the lives of others. Do you see the purpose that God has for you and, and using what he has given you to be able to, to uh, accomplish that purpose. We're going to be taking a look at 1 Peter 4.10. That's the last place that we're going to be going in God's Word today, so I'll give you a little bit of, of time to get there. So, so how can we be gift givers throughout the year? What's a, what's a good, God-pleasing way to make that happen? What, what would be a way that we could bring honor and glory to God and and a, a, a huge level of joy and, and satisfaction, a sense of fulfillment, a sense of purposefulness, even in our own lives. And that is simply making ourselves available to God, making ourselves available to one another in the church and in supporting the work and the mission and the ministry of your own church. You're getting involved, rolling up your sleeves, jumping in there, um, being ready to say, I, I can do that, rather than coming up with reasons why you, you can't get involved, instead start looking at ways you can be involved. And, and to, to, to be there for one another, to support one another, to encourage one another, to love one another. I know you guys are capable of this. I see it you know, uh, from time to time, but I, it'd be great to just see this more and more often as, as God's people pull together. God's people do great things with each other. But it's also to be seen not just among ourselves, which would, you know, that's a, that's, a good, that's a good thing, but it also can become a selfish thing if it causes us from looking beyond our walls. And, and so we can be that, that, uh, that, that gift throughout the year to the community around us, being that gift to uh, our employers or our employees, to be that gift to our neighbors, to be that gift to our friends, to be that gift to our coworkers, by, by being willing to pour ourselves out into other people's lives, by being willing to make those sacrifices, to, to take those stretches, to, to learn how to better use your life to be able to impact the lives of others. These are all great places for us to look at throughout the year to say, God, how can you use me? God, where do you want to use me? What have you given me? What are the natural and spiritual gifts and abilities that you have blessed me with that I can use them? In what ways can I use my time, leverage my time for you? In what ways can I uh, leverage my financial resources? In what way can I lift, uh, 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 leverage my, my gifts and abilities to bring honor and glory to you through the people of my community and, to, and people beyond uh, this community? Those are all great places for us to be looking at and saying, how can we do this? And with, with us and ourselves, it's not possible. But those words that we read about in Matthew, where Jesus was sending them out two by two, those words resonate here and now, that Jesus is sending you out too and saying, I have given you the power to do the things that I do. I will gift you those things. I will give those things to you. I want you to be a blessing to others. I want you to give as freely as you've received from me. I want you to be willing to give to others. And you know, that's a Sometimes that's a, that's a difficult measuring stick, isn't it? Because if, if we're not giving and generous with others, then it kind of speaks to something in our life that maybe we don't see um, or appreciate the generosity of God. We don't maybe fully appreciate what God has done for us. Uh, we might say that we do, but is it working itself out in our lives in ways that show and demonstrate, you know what, I'm so thankful for what God has done. What better way to say thank you to God than to be doing the things that God wants you to do, and not because you're trying to pay Him off, not because you're trying to pay Him back, but because you're truly, truly just so thankful for what God has done, and, and you want to be that blessing in the world around you. Um, here's what it says in 1 Peter 4.10, because you might be thinking, well, what gifts do I have to give? Here's what Peter writes. God has given each of you a gift. 
from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Okay, there's quite a few things in that little passage there. First of all, God has given each of you, every one of you who are hearing this right now, every one of you who put your faith and your trust in Jesus, who are, who are Christ followers, the Bible is telling us, Peter is telling us, one of the people who is closest to Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's telling you that you have a spiritual gift. You have a gift that God has given from his huge variety of spiritual gifts. A lot of, a lot of times people try to say, well, you know, there are the seven spiritual gifts. There are far more than just seven spiritual gifts. There are lots and lots of gifts that, that God can give to us that are used in a spiritual way that will bring honor and glory to Him. And so there are so many of these. And God is saying there that, that, that each of you at least has one gift. And, and some of us have more than just one gift. And God wants you to use those gifts to make a difference in, in people's lives. And it says here, use them well to serve one another. Now, when he talks about one another, he's talking about in the church, but he's also talking about outside the church too. This one another isn't inclusive to Christians only. It means serve one another well, but serve one another. Serve others who are beyond your walls and, and make that, that critical difference in their lives. These kinds of gifts that you can give, and really only you can give. These are spiritual gifts that God has given you that he wants you to develop and to work on. And does it take time? Sure it does. Um, is there a bit of a learning curve? Sure it is. Is it, is it difficult? Is it hard? Um, will it be challenging? Yeah, it's not gonna come like that. Um, but God will take you where you're at. And through baby steps, he'll get you going. He'll get you going like a, like a great coach or a great trainer. He takes you where you're at and then moves you forward. And the more that you spend time drilling down on this and, and learning how to best use your gifts and abilities, um, God will help you as you use them. He will grow them. And you'll start seeing ways that you can use them uh, to bring honor and glory to Him. These are the kinds of gifts that, that you can uh, bring to bear in the year ahead that will bring honor and glory to God. These, these kinds of gifts and the way that we use these gifts to make that difference fill our Father's heart with so much joy. I mean, think about it. Don't you feel a lot of um, good godly pride when your children do something that you see is, is generous or you see them doing something that, that, that's just, you know, you're so proud of them because they've, they've grown, they've matured, and they're, 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 they're making something good of their lives. Well, that's the way the Father feels about me, and that's the way He feels about you. It fills His heart with joy. He, he's proud of you in what you're doing because your love for Him is, is moving you forward. And that the more that you grow in that love for Him, the more that it just becomes a joyful, generous response, not because you have to, but because you want to. That's how we can do the gift giving throughout the whole year. And all God's people said, Amen.